Good morning. Good morning. And God bless you. Amen. Beautiful day, isn't it? Yes, sir. Amen. And we do give thanks to God and to our lovely Lord Jesus Christ. And we do praise God for his mercy upon us, his favor upon us in these days. How grateful we are. And my wife and I, we were, we were uh, watching a um, movie on yesterday, and it was called The Day the Earth Stood Still. You, you've seen that? Yes, sir. Keanu Reeves, I think. Keanu, am I saying it right? Keanu? Keanu Reeves. But he, he plays this, this role of a alien, I guess. Yeah. He's from out of somewhere outside of uh, Earth. And along with him, there is this big, huge uh, statue, I guess. I don't know, but robot standing in Central Park there in New York. And there are these um, pods of, of spheres all over the world. And these pods are picking up specimens of animals around the world because they're going to destroy the earth. Amen. And, and my wife and I, we were just sitting there and, and, and we, we would just found it remarkable. And, and in fact, it was intriguing because in, in Keanu Reeves, one of his statements as this, um, and he's a savior of sort. He's He's playing the part of a savior, but not a savior of men. Amen. He's a savior of the earth. He came to save the earth yes. from men and their wickedness. And, and we, I, I, my wife and I, we, just, we were just amazed and intrigued by that concept, that thinking that the earth has greater value than men. Amen. That the earth and the animals are worth saving more so than men. Amen. And it is not a new environmental, and, and in fact, it is an environmental um, uh, mantra or, or preaching. That's, that's what they preach in envir extreme environmentalism. They, they preach this idea that man, that we are destroying the earth, the ozone and all the other, uh, uh, we're just killing the earth. Mother, we're, yeah, we're killing Mother Earth. Yeah, um, and, and so it's, it's not new. In fact, this, this thinking is as old as man and, and sin in the earth. I want you to hear it afresh from a biblical perspective, this thinking. And we're, once again, we're in Romans chapter 1. In Romans 1, and I want to start again at verse 18. We looked at this passage um, a couple of weeks ago. And here in, in Romans 1, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness Amen. and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for even since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made let, let me just pause right there and give some clarity to what Paul is saying here um, perhaps for, for some who um, 
I mean, Paul is, is a, he's what we call wordy. He's verbose. He likes words. He's a wordsmith, and, and he can string phrases and words along, and before you know it, you're, you're like, wow, what is, what is he saying? And, and here in, in the verse, basically, he's saying that God has revealed himself to all men. And how did he do that? He has shown it to them, verse 19, and it says, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, even his invisible attributes are clearly seen. That is, the attributes of God that we don't see, God has revealed it through creation so we can see it. The invisible attributes God has manifested to us. That his, he's powerful. That he is majestic and glorious. There's so much we can learn from the created order. In fact, the Bible says in, in a Psalm, the Psalm writer said that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork, his ability, his wisdom. All of this can be seen in creation. Being understood, I'm continuing, by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Basically, no one will be able, ever will be able to stand before God and say, I did not know. No atheist, no atheist, no atheist can stand before God and, and will be able to honestly say, I had no idea. God says, they're without excuse. No one has an excuse because God has revealed himself by way of creation. Powerful demonstration of, of, his, of his eternal Godhead so that no one can say, I did not know. Verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. When we're not thankful, and I know we talked about it last week, but I, I just can't resist it again this week, that uh, Thanksgiving is so essential that you and I do this, that we be thankful when we're not thankful, it sets us up for bitterness. It sets us up for, for futility. Because basically what it does when we're not, basically when, when the fall in human nature is, is arrogant. One, one of, our, one of the, the demonstrations that we are, are godless is our arrogance. We, we think we are independent of God, that we can do without God. And in our arrogance, we become futile in our thinking. We can do without God, so guess what? We don't have to thank him for nothing. And people, people who are, are unthankful, who aren't living a thankful expression to God, are not expressing thanks to God, it's out of their arrogance. They're, they're, they're simply sinfully arrogant because they think they're independent of God. They don't need God. See, they're futile in their thinking. Their thoughts are foolish. Here it is. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. When, when men aren't thankful to God, when we don't worship the true God, we will find a God. We will find someone or something to fill the void. God created us to be worshipers. And when we don't worship the true God, Something or someone we will find to fill the void. What Paul is, is uh, fill, um, sharing here in verse 23, that men, mankind changed the glory of the incorruptible God 
and made the glory of the incorruptible God like corruptible man. And they began to worship animals, the animal kingdom. Hence, I, I go back to the movie. The movie was about the, trying to highlight the failure of man to protect the environment and that the, the stewards of the universe came to the earth to save the earth from man. And by doing so, they exalt the creature, animals, and the earth above the glory of God revealed in man. God put man in the earth to rule over, to have dominion over the earth. But the environmental movement has um, reversed the order. And I, I don't have a thing against uh, trees, birds, uh, four-footed animals. I, God is, is wise in his creation. I guess when I see him, I would like to ask him why in the world he would invent uh, or create caterpillars, hairy creatures. I mean, just disgusting little. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I just would love to know. Now I know they have a place and a purpose, but I'm just saying. But God, God is, is wise in his creation of all, but he put man over. Man is not subservient. If, if anyone needs to be saved, it's man. It's, it's not animals. It's mankind. And, and so our, our world is, is so caught up with, with the rejection and the suppression of truth as it relates to God. And it, it's coming at us in, in so many ways. Movies, music, it's, it's just everywhere. In the media, it's, it's, it's being taught in schools, the suppression of truth. And, and I, I just want to revisit this idea um, that we are on a, a precipice. And, and in fact, I, I believe we have fallen from the precipice. I, I just want to say, um, in fact, let me do it by way of reading this passage. Turn with me to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. I, I believe with all my heart that we are under the censure, the condemnation, and judgment of God in this nation. That doesn't bode well, and I, I don't imagine um, this message will, will, will have you jumping and shouting. But... Um, you hired me to tell you the truth. Yes, you did. You did. You hired me. Um, and, and so I'm just trying to fulfill my, my job responsibility to you. Um, you see, I, I don't want to become a pastor who, who um, adulterates, who adulterates his calling. See, it's my responsibility, as Ezekiel will help us to see, it's my responsibility to warn you. And uh, uh, pastors who adulterate themselves, who um, prostitute even, prostitute oh. themselves. Oh, oh, they have. Oh, there are many pastors who have prostituted themselves, their gifts, their abilities. They prostituted themselves to the world. And some have, have made out pretty well financially in doing so. But in order to get the applause, the approval, the uh, sanction of the culture and the world, they prostitute themselves. They become, they have become, many of them have become servants of the culture <laughs> instead of servants of God. And, and I just want you to know, I, as, as long as I can, as long as God permits, and as long as you will have me, I, I want to stay true to what God has called me to do and what you hired me to do. 
Ezekiel helps me with my understanding of what that is. Look at Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 16. Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. And you give him no warning. So what is God saying? God is saying, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, you better tell him. Yes, sir. And you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your own soul. Now clearly, I'm reading a text from the Old Testament, and we're not living under the Old Covenant. But what I'm doing, I'm borrowing a principle from the Old Testament that is no less true relative to contemporary preachers and pastors and teachers of the word of God that we are responsible to warn we are watchmen on the wall see the watchman the watchman was the man um, in the Old Testament was the man at, as, as the gates the walls are up around the city and the watchman was had had a, a watchtower on on the wall of, of the city the watchtower, inside the watchtower, the watchman was to be in the watchtower looking out over the horizon, trying to make sure his job is to sound the trumpet if he sees enemy, if the enemy coming. Amen. He didn't have time to play pinochle. He couldn't sit up there and twiddle his thumbs and, and, and play his little uh, game. Uh, he, no, he had to watch. Watch and warn. That was his responsibility. Amen. And as, as New Testament um, um, pastors and teachers of the Word of God, we have the same responsibility to warn. And, and so God has given us the responsibility to look out over the horizon yes. and, and watch. Just look. Look at the enemy that have come into the gates of our city. And they are among us, beloved. They have come among us. And it is my responsibility to warn. And so I, I, I shared with you a few weeks ago that we, we, have, we have made a huge uh, turn away from God. And, and it has been progressive. It has been progressive. Um, it, it, it wasn't all of a sudden. This thing has been in, in the making for centuries. Um, but uh, prophetically speaking, we are sitting right now at the place where we're prophetically speaking that uh, we're, we're looking at a time when the way things are lining up right now um, prophetically it looks as if it doesn't have to work out this way but it certainly looks as looks as if with with the uh, situation that we have in the Middle East Looks like a, a, the possibility of a third world war. And if you know anything about the prophecy, if you know anything about scripture proclaiming the, the, the end times, you discover that in the prophetic message, in the prophetic um, uh, tomes of scripture, what we discover is that before God comes back to this earth, there will be an antichrist. A man who will become a world ruler. He will bring peace to the world. But before he can bring peace, there has to be a huge conflagration of war. Yes, sir. Warring nations. Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of war. Nations against nations. And, and here we are right there at the, the very edge. Amen. The church is awaiting its upward call that uh, he will rapture, he will snatch, he will take the church out of the world before the tribulation period comes in, into, this, uh, in, into this age. 
And so the church is removed. But what is interesting, what is interesting that before the church exits, here we are, we're watching, we're watching exactly what the scripture has said unfolded for us here in Romans 1, that the apostle Paul says that we are under the judgment of God. God is judging this nation for its turn, suppression of truth, and its turn away from God. Now, how do we know we're under the judgment of God? Now, I, I find it interesting that America, I say to you, is under the judgment of God. And I find it interesting that America, as we know it, the United States of America, is not listed, not named in biblical history. It's not named in prophetic future. You've got to ask yourself, where is America in God's thinking? In God's thinking, either America has been absorbed by a confederation of other nations, which means America won't be a singular world power as it exists today, or America will fall from its rank as a world leader Amen. and become a second or third world power where it really doesn't matter in terms of world affairs. And with that in mind, I want to suggest to you that there are, as, as I'm, again, I, what, what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm trying to digest this, this thing of, uh, that, that we watched unfold um, relative to um, the legalization of homosexual marriage. Amen. And, and some of you might struggle with me struggling with it. Some of you might be saying, well, look, man, just get over it. Let's move on. I mean, but, but it's, 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 it's bigger. It, it's bigger than, than, than you, you may in initially um, think. It, it's huge. This is not just simply another crazy law. And you leave it to Annapolis, you leave it to Washington, D.C., they can make some crazy, absolutely, utterly crazy laws. And, and here is one of them. But it's not just another crazy law. Amen. This is the institutionalization of what God condemns. Amen. It's institutionalizing the abomination that God has condemned. Yes. When a nation condones what God condemns, God puts them on his hit list. Yes. We are in the, the sights of God, the your, the scope, yeah, the, the marksman has, 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 a, has a, a scope on his rifle. We're, we're in it. We're, we're in his bullseye. We're in his bullseye. Uh, and I, I want to demonstrate for you why that is and, and that God um, has, has a right. In fact, let, let me go beyond that, beyond right. God just has to do this. Yeah. He has to judge us. It is necessary that God judge us. If, if he, and, and I, I'm using the words as uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously using them, but he has to. If he fails to judge, then he fails to be God. It's, it's just that serious with us, beloved. He has to do this thing. And without a doubt, the passing of this law has brought us under the censure of God. And I, I want to read the passage here once again. And I want to demonstrate as we work through this, because I, there, there are some takeaways I want to share with you. Things that you and I can do, should do, in light of where we are in, in, our, uh, in our journey, prophetically speaking. 
So my, my assignment today is I want to share with you Romans 1. I want to point out to you once again here in Romans 1. Okay. From there, I want to illustrate for you the, the, um, the, the historical, from the historical biblical record, God's method of dealing with nations that reject, suppress, and change his glory. I want to demonstrate that from Scripture. And then finally, I want to give to you some takeaways things that you and I as Bible believers, now this, see, this isn't for everyone, and I realize that. I'm not, I, I realize that in, in a congregation like this, not everybody is, is saved, and I realize that not everyone who says that they're saved is really convinced. I understand, we, we have a mixed group in here, I really understand that, but there's one message I have for everyone, and, and that, that's what I, I want to explore today, and, and in the exploration of this message, I just want to say that God has a right. And, and I, I use this uh, real um, respectfully, but he has a responsibility as God, as a holy God, to judge sin. Amen. He has to, beloved. The nature of God, we read here in, in terms of the attributes, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. There are aspects of God's uh, attributes that we, we just can't visibly see. And, and some of those attributes of, of God are, for instance, when, when you think about the holiness of God, what does that look like? What does holiness and purity look like in, in terms of God's nature? Well, well God, God has revealed um, purity and holiness his holiness in, in so many perfections, in all of his perfections, his holiness is clear. It is clear. And, and so when, when the Bible says in verse 18 that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, God is using himself his holiness as the standard of measuring behavior, attitudes, and actions. When I look at you and you look at me, we compare ourselves to each other, we ain't all that bad. In fact, we probably could go and find some folk who we think are just pitiful because we're comparing ourselves with them. God doesn't compare people with people Amen. to determine what's right. God compares us with him. And, and we fall short of the glory and the holiness of God. So when he says here in this text, and I want you to find it, Romans 1 once again. Verse 24, therefore God also gave them up unto uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their own bodies among themselves. When men suppress the truth, God says, okay, do it your way. That's passive judgment. That's God passively letting men have what they want. There was an incident in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where the Apostle Paul was, was astonished. In, in the Corinthian church, there, there was a, a brother, he called himself a brother, and he was sleeping, having sexual intercourse with his father's wife. Now, that would be not his biological mother, but his stepmom, I guess, in our day having a sexual intercourse with, and you know what, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it, it would make for a great movie today, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, how many movies have you seen that, that play out these kinds of roles? I mean, it's incredible. But, but the church had condoned it, had accepted it as normal. And Paul says, I've already judged, I'm not even there, I've heard about it, I've already judged that this man, he needs to be put out. And, and the, the whole idea illustrating what? That um, God 
doesn't have a toleration of sin at all, nor, nor should his people. And, and this text says that they dishonored their bodies among themselves, and God gave them over. Paul said, this man, if you, if you want to help him, you let him go. You turn him over to Satan. So Satan can buffet and beat his body. So Satan can destroy his body that his soul may be saved. That's part of God's judgment. Part of God's judgment is to passively allow people to have what they think they want. And some people right now are living under the judgment of God violating sexual standards that God has put in place. And God, God has warned. God has put a watchman on the wall. He's put it in the word. He's had people to say it, to tell it, to preach it, to teach it. And, and people still persist in, okay, that's what you want? Go for it. That's the judgment of God. And then Paul says, once the devil is done with his body, Let's try and save his soul. See, the, 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 the implication is that with this passive judgment, the, the understanding is, is that if he is at all a brother, he will come to his senses after the devil is through with him. And that's so unfortunate that so many saints get tied up in, in sin and only after the devil has ruined their, temp, their, their, their testimony, ruined their lives, ruined their body, and then they come dragging back to God beat up, worn out. God, God wants to save. And sometimes people, people in their stubbornness reject what God, that's the suppression of truth. And so when men suppress truth, okay, go ahead. You got it. So God did what? He turned them over to it. Look at the next verse, 25. Who exchanged the truth of God, not only do they suppress the truth, but they exchange the truth for the lie. Not a lie, the lie. Yeah. See, the lie goes all the way back to Genesis where Satan told the woman, you don't have to worship him. Be your own God. You choose what you want to do. Live like you want to live. They exchanged. They, de they decided, no, you know, I don't like God's truth. I think I'm going to do my own thing. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, and this is the, the, the text. For this reason, see, once we suppress truth um, and when, when we exchange the truth, God turns us over and he, then finally he gives us up to vile passions. Vile. Um, one translation, is, uh, the word vile translates the word vile as, as disgusting, abhorrent gave them up to vile passions for even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Now, obviously, if you look at the movies, if you listen to television, if you listen to the news, you, you don't get this perception of, of homosexuality as being evil as something abhorrent or vile. No, what you get is that it is an alternative lifestyle, that there's another choice. And, and when a culture does this, it's clear that they're under the judgment of God. Amen. We are, beloved, under the judgment of God. This is the sign that we are being judged by God. Why? Because now it's being institutionalized. It's, being, it's been legalized. It has been accepted. That is, we're condoning what God condemns. Amen. And when a nation, when a culture reaches that, that point, that vortex, that place, God lets them have it. And, and that's the judgment of God. That's what I'm saying, beloved. We're under the censure, the judgment of God's judgment isn't just coming, it's here. <laughs> when, when, when our state and other states voted and eventually the, the nation, it looks like, is going to accept it, when that happens, we, it indicates that we already are being judged by God. Amen. What does God do with um, nations? He disposes of them. <laughs> 
he turns them over. I, I want to uh, share with you the next few moments. So look, look with me at several passages um, in the Old Testament. And I'm going to cite some nations for you that we're going to take a look at. But I want you to read the word. We're getting ready to start, by the way, a, a new year. And I, I so want the, the body to engage in the reading of the word of God. There is nothing like it. It, it, it just cl clarifies so much. And, and beloved, as a, as a believer, as a professing believer, and I say professing, um, because I want to distinguish between professing and possessing, that, that a lot of us profess. The question is, are we really possessing the truth? And, and what are we doing with the truth? And, and I just want to encourage you, beloved, that as a believer, you need to be reading the Word of God. Yes, sir. And I um, just want to encourage you to do that. But here in, in the Old Testament... Here in, for instance, in Genesis chapter 6. Look with me in Genesis chapter 6 and verse um, 5. Start with me there. And what we have there in Genesis 6 is a statement from God concerning a culture. Look at Genesis 6. Are you there with me? And I'm reading from verse uh, five. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It, it almost sounds like Romans 1, but in a different nuance. Continually thinking about what? Evil. They're obsessed with evil and wickedness. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made man. What do we, what do we discover from this? That God has a, a, uh, a pitch. He, he has a... An, an end. There is an end. In fact, in Genesis um, um, chapter um, 9, I believe, I think the, the word of God says that my spirit will not always strive with man. That God has an end to his patience. His, now, now, the scripture says he's long-suffering, and thanks be to God that he is, Amen. but he has an end to it. It says that his mercy endures forever. But yet he's, he has an end. And, and the mercy that, that he offers, actually, is for his people. <laughs> his mercy endures forever for his people. But not for wickedness. God has an end. And so what did he do? He destroyed the earth. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 15. Look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. And, and what, I'm, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm just reading through the Word of God, and, and in the Word of God, there are, it's like a catalog, a catalog, a listing of nations that God has destroyed or rejected. Look at, look at Genesis 15, and beginning at verse 12. Look at verse 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly, certainly, that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. God is saying to Abram that Israel is going to be a servant to Egypt for 400 years. Verse 14, and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Amen. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. God allows, permits Egypt to enslave Israel for 400 years. Now, some might argue, well, that's exactly what God wants. God wanted Egypt to enslave them. Not at all. God permitted it. 
But that was not the ideal will of God. In fact, the, that they're down in Egypt that long, instead of moving back, is part of the reason why they fell into, in, into that enslavement. Scripture says, I will judge Egypt. God judged Egypt. Look at Isaiah chapter 10. I'm sorry, forgive me. I, I want to read another verse. Look, look, look here, before we finish here in Genesis. Now, as far as you shall go, as far as you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What is this? Exactly. The iniquity of the Amorites is not finished, meaning God is allowing, permitting the Amorites to reach a level of intolerance, as far as he's concerned, that they haven't reached the intolerable level. But when they do, God is going to send Israel into Canaan to root out the Amorites. That's basically what he's saying there. That right now, in, in this context, the Amorites were in Canaan. God was going to call Israel out of Egypt, send them into Canaan, and drive out the Amorites. But their sin hadn't reached an intolerable level as yet. I find that amazing. What do we learn from that? What do we learn from this, this exercise? That God puts up with wickedness in nations up to a point. But then he's going to take some action. Look at another passage. Look at Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. I want to encourage you, please, uh, write these passages down. And you, you'll, you'll, you'll be amazed at, at the, the kind of language that God is using in terms of his condemnation of, of nations. So what do we have so far? We have the Amorites, the, the nation of Amorites, God judged. We have Egypt, God is going to judge. We have Assyria. Look at Assyria, chapter 10, verse 5. In chapter 10, verse 5, the writer says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. Now, wait a minute. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. Do you know what's happening here? Assyria is being used by God to destroy other nations. God is using an evil and a wicked nation to destroy other nations. But then he says, I'm going to get you too, Assyria. <laughs> I just find that amazing. He says they're the rod. They, they are the rod of my anger. I'm angry with those other nations, and I'm using Assyria to take them down. But he says, woe to you, Assyria. Look at verse 6. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. That's incredible that God will use one nation to destroy another nation. But look at another instant. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25. This, this is just incredible. I mean, the, the, the kind of... Of, of providential exercise God uses when he's employing one nation against another nation. All for his glory. Look at Jeremiah 25. And I'm going to start reading at, at verse 8. You there? Jeremiah 25, verse 8. In Jeremiah 25, verse 8, you'll find these words. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north. God is talking to Judah and Israel. I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. 
and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and a perpetual desolation. What in the world is going on? God calls Nebuchadnezzar, that evil, wicked king of Babylon, God calls him my servant. What's up with that? God was using Nebuchadnezzar. God raised him up for what? To destroy other nations. I'm, 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 I'm tickled. I'm tickled. Every time I hear somebody say to me, I am, I am tickled that God isn't into politics. Are you kidding me? The entire, the entire Bible declares that politically speaking, because polis means the people, that God is interested in people and nations. He raises kings up and he takes them. If that's not politics, what is? And, and he, he doesn't ask for permission. <laughs> doesn't care what you and I think. But he used Nebuchadnezzar as a servant. But I don't want you to miss this. Look in verse 12. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed. See, he's going to send Israel into Babylon for 70 years, punish them. He's going to punish Israel, his people, with Babylon through Nebuchadnezzar, 70 years, sends them into exile in a foreign land, punishes them for 70 years. After 70 years, he's going to bring them back to their land. But look, look at verse 12. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon, that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. I just find that so intriguing, that God raises up Nebuchadnezzar, knows he's arrogant, knows he is, is wicked, but God uses wicked men to accomplish his purpose. Oh, my goodness, did this help me. This helped me, this election cycle. It really did. It helped me understand what's going on in our world. God uses wicked men. Whether they be governor, whether they be mayor, whether they be president, whether they be legislator, God uses wicked men to bring about his will in this world. I, I just find it intriguing. He raised Nebuchadnezzar up, knowing he's going to be arrogant and wicked used him, called him my servant. He punishes Israel. Then after Israel gets her punishment, now he turns his sights back on, and now, now I'm going to get you for doing that to Israel. What? What? <laughs> oh, man. God is God. I, you know, as I was reading, I, I could go on and cite more nations, more nations. The Amorites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Moabites. He did the same thing with these nations. The Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. He raised them up, took them down. Let me ask you this. Where is, where, um, Rome used to be, used to be a, 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 an empire, world empire. Where are they today? They're not an empire, are they? gone. And, and all you'll, you'll hear of Rome is what? It's a city. <laughs> that's, that's the Vatican. That's where the Vatican is. But it's not a world power. It's not an empire. It no longer uses it, its collateral as, as a world power. God did this with nations. The Medes, they were world power. The Persians, world powers. The Greeks, Alexander the Great, world power. Romans, Caesar, world power. America. We are a world power. But we're arrogant. And I don't mean arrogant among nations to nation. I'm talking we're arrogant in our, in our suppression and rejection of God's truth. America. Russia. China. Saudi Arabia. Egypt. Syria. North Korea. South Korea. Arrogant. Indonesia, Sudan, you name it. These nations in this world, all of them are in God's sight. And beloved, we, we have become a evil and wicked nation. 
it was um, Alexis de Tocqueville, he's given credit for this statement, that America is great because America is good. When America ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. We have lost our way, beloved, our goodness. We have aborted innocent lives Amen. to the tune of 50 million babies since Roe versus Wade. When Cain slew Abel, God came to Cain and he said, the blood of your brother cries up. What do you think 50, the blood of 50 million babies is saying to God? God has to judge this country, beloved. You can't, you can't just slaughter innocent life. People that are made in the image of God. What is clear is, is that our, our country is on a destructive path and has been for a good while. Back in the Old Testament, um, babies were sacrificed in Canaan to Molech. Molech. That's, that's why God, one of the reasons why God sent Israel into Canaan to drive out this kind of hideous evil and wickedness. That's why he sent the holy people into that land to cast out the evil wickedness that was in that land. And here they were sacrificing their babies to the god Molech, making their children walk through fire, burning them in fire, thinking that Molech was going to bless them. Hideous. Beloved, Molech lives in the name of rights, the rights of the woman over her body. We are, we are, we are on, a, on a path of God's for God's judgment. And, and one of the things that incensed God all the more was that leaders, the leaders, political leaders and religious leaders condoned, condoned the evil. In, in the very, some of the same passages I read to you, God, God condemns these false shepherds of his people who led Israel in, into this kind of debauchery. And, and it was necessary that God judge. And so the, um, again, um, we, we are, we're in a um, in tremendous place right now um, of, of judgment. And wh what do we take away from this? There, there are some things I want, to take, I want you to take away. Just let me recommend these uh, takeaways. As, as we're living in this day and in this time, one, one of the first things I want to suggest as a takeaway is that as believers, we need to work on our, our stuff, our marriage, our marriages. We do. It's, it's tough and difficult, not impossible, but it's difficult to proclaim a righteous standard when the church is failing in itself to maintain that standard. Amen. And when standards of... of, uh, of um, fornication and, and divorce are reaching the same level as the world, then, then we, we don't have, we're, we're not teaching, we're not preaching, we're not standing in, in a place of, 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 of moral um, uh, standard that we can set for the world. If we're, if we're guilty of the same, Amen. beloved, we, we, we need to work on our marriages. We need to protect them, protect our marriage. Um, husbands and wives, protect your marriage. Do everything you can to secure your marriage. Do not, do not allow. In fact, failure is not an option for believers when it comes to protecting your marriage. Marriage reflects the glory of God. You and I are stewards of God's glory. God forbid that anyone, said anyone, that we would take this, this opportunity today in this culture today and, and fail to proclaim 
a consistent message with the word of God that marriage is worth protecting. It is worth salvaging. It is worth, it is worth husbands and wives being faithful. Faithful to protect your marriage by being emotionally faithful. You, you don't want, you don't want to get emotionally tied up with other people. Protect your, your relationship. You don't want to physically engage in a relationship with someone other than your, your, your wife and your husband. Protect your marriage at all costs. Why? Because the Bible says judgment must first begin at the house of God. And if it starts here, what will the end be of those who are not saved? The Bible says if the, if, the, if the saved are scarcely saved, I mean, we barely make it ourselves, the, the writer is saying. We, we need to protect our marriages at all costs. Two, number two, takeaway, we need to teach our children. It, it's not just about our generation. It is about the next generation. See, right now, our kids, and God help our children. Our children are facing some dark, dark days they're being taught in many schools right now the legitimacy of two men marrying two men marrying two women marrying are, are, are you five and three five year olds are being exposed to this kind of godless teaching and if they're not hearing it at home if, if we're not protecting them with the word the truth the word of God God help them they're going to grow up so confused and, and darkened in their thinking. Our culture is wasting no time at all in reaching the next generation. They've already started. Teach your children the honorable, the honorable nature of marriage. Don't let your children hear you speak neg negatively of marriage. Don't don't dare um, belittle your, your, your wife or your husband in front of your kids. Teach them to honor, honor marriage, honor father, honor mother. See, it's tough for us to proclaim to the world that homosexual marriage is wrong when they look at us and see sad, sad representation of what is true. Another takeaway. We need to set up for our uh, church and beyond in, in, in our culture, um, mentoring couples to assist married couples, to assist and train newlywed couples, to assist struggling couples, to assist and train engaged couples. Why? Be because we, we want marriage done God's way. So, I, I'm, I'm throwing these things out there, but I, I, like seeds, I just hope I and mean, pray that uh, the Spirit of God will take them and, and use them in your lives uh, to, to create venues where, where you're helping. Take, take your, your 30, your 25 year, 30, 40, 50, 60, I don't know, 60 years of marriage. You have something to say. You have something to share. And I, I heard Michael preach earlier, I, I don't care how old you get, you're never, forget about retiring. We retire when we go home to be with Jesus. There's some work that all of us have to do, every one of us. And it's a shame if, if you have gifts like that, if you have, you have the blessing of God, the favor of God on you, your life, your marriage, your home, and you're not sharing that gift with others. Find a way, find a way. And, and then here's another um, takeaway. I, I learned something this, this time. And um, this, this is, I, I think, perhaps one of the um, most important things I learned. That the battle is not won by human effort. I mean, let me explain what I mean, mean by that. That um, we, we spent hours, a, n a number of men and pastors and groups, we spent hours traveling, doing all kinds of, well, you were part of that, the petition. We spent hours and man hours and, and getting the word out about marriage, God's way, one man, one woman. And, and there, was a subtle, there was a subtle message that was, was uh, being um, proclaimed that we were told that by way of focus group polls, polling, 
and, and by way of um, high price um, advertising agencies, they recommended that in our protection of marriage, that we not bring the discussion of God into that. Because they polled groups of people, focus groups, and, and tested them to find out what, what moved them more, what was more important in their hearing. They didn't want to hear that God has a way, that God's ways are right. They didn't want to hear the teaching of the scripture that condemns homosexual. A focus group says that if, if we go that route, we're going to lose the election here in Maryland. If, if we're going to lose, let's lose telling the truth. <laughs> not, not lose. And, and you know what? You know what? Now, now here, I'm, I'm, I'm playing the, the uh, Monday morning quarterback. And, and here, here's, a, here's a passage I, I, I want to re read for you. It, it says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. You needn't turn there, but I want to read it for you. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What I understand Paul to be saying is that we don't wage war as the church. We don't wage war like the world wages war. We don't need Park Avenue advertisers to tell us how to wage a spiritual warfare. We wage it spiritually. We pull down, we argue from a spiritual perspective. And so I'm, I'm afraid that what, what, uh, we, well, what I learned is, is that we, we disarmed ourselves essentially trying to fight a spiritual warfare with with carnal weapons and we're no good the church is no good fighting spiritually with carnal weapons our, our strength is 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 in God I, I and here I am playing the Monday morning quarterback quarterback and and what if what if in our subtle rejection and suppression of God's name in this argument and our subtle rejection of those scriptures. I mean, um, let, let me just go ahead and share this. Um, Pastor Anderson read the word of God at our, at our um, uh, town hall meeting and read the word of God, Romans 1, that, that people who, who um, practice these things and those who, who um, condone these things are worthy of death. That's exactly what God says in his word. And, 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 and there was a huge uproar that hit the uh, Maryland Marriage Alliance. And we were, we, were, we were asked to take it down off of the um, YouTube. We had it up on YouTube, and that's, that's where the world found out about it because we, we um, thanks be to God, uh, uh, the guy, he, he put it up on YouTube so that we can get the word out. Well, well, there was so much, so much whoop de doo and that um, the, the, the group we were working with came under so much fire that they asked us to take it down. And they insisted because that event was their event. We only hosted them. So in a legal sense, we had to yield to them. But I learned so much, learned so much. Here we are, I'm playing Monday morning quarterback. God, what, who's to say that if we had preached the word, stood on truth, proclaimed what God said, you mean to tell me that God couldn't have won this thing? God, see, God wants the glory, not men. See, I, I, I just, I, I've learned so much. I've learned so much. And uh, that, that as a church, <laughs> we, we, we do need to be uh, careful in, in who we... Uh, bond ourselves with and make sure that our message is their message right. and um, anyway that's that's a takeaway that's a takeaway 
but also we need to celebrate marriage. We need to celebrate it. And I, I look forward to a time when we, as Manor Bible, will host an annual conference and banquet for the celebration of marriage God's way. I, I look forward to that. Why, why can't we do that? We, we can do that, beloved. Um, just takeaways, just takeaways. And then finally, um, the most important, Jesus is coming. <laughs> I, if I don't, if I don't, if I, if I don't uh, say anything else, he's coming. That, that is so obvious, so obvious that he's coming. And I, I am so glad, I am so glad that I have vested, vested in the kingdom of God. And, and I, I just want to say to you, beloved, that um, you and I, God, see, God is calling. He's not trying to save the culture. That's not what God is after. In, in fact, in Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching, and, and the Bible says, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. You need to come out of it. See, the problem with the church, one of the problems with the church is that we're so tied up in, in this perverse generation, in this perverse culture, that we don't, we don't even know who, and who, who to vote for anymore. <laughs> we, we, we just, we're clueless. We're clueless about the issues that, that separate us from the world. We're, 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 we're confused because we're so tied up with the world. We, we, want, we, want, we want to be approved by, by our friends. Well, when we seek to be approved by the world, we're going to be disapproved by God. Amen. Ultimately, ultimately, um, um, though, though disappointing this, this season has been for us, the church, and I'm sure many of you felt the the same thing that I felt, uh, the disappointment in, in our um, electorate and, and the people. And I, I hope that's the case. I hope none of, you, uh, n none of, um, none of us were glad to hear that, you know, same-sex marriage passed. But um, though disappointed, our ultimate hope is in Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. And, and this world, this world just can't do it for me any longer. There was a time when I was ignorant of truth, of the word of God, ignorant of God's call, ignorant of his purpose and his will, what he's doing, what he, what he wants to do. I was ignorant of it. And there was a time when, when my heart was in the world, after the world, sought the world, lived the world. But today, beloved, this world has nothing for me. Nothing. And, and the longer I live, the, the, more, the, the more desperate, the more desperate I am and longing for Jesus to come. I've, I've got to have him. I've got to have him. He alone satisfied, nothing else. I love what Paul said in Titus. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God has offered himself to all men. And, and he's teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. An ungodly, perverse, and wicked present age. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this age. And do what? The Apostle Paul says, we're looking. For the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's my hope. I, I, I hope that's your hope. You. There's some in our midst today, Father, who, who perhaps are, are um, without a hope that transcends this world.